Think Forward. Think Research Channel. Today's special guest once lamented, people are now more interested in writers than in their writing. And I think this audience will prove that wrong. Uh, Salman Rushdie is arguably one of the most brilliant, famous, and controversial writers of our time. Although he is best known for his fourth book, The Satanic Verses, he has written some two dozen books, is the recipient of numerous literary awards, and holds eight honorary doctorates, including an honorary professorship in the humanities at MIT. As I'm sure all of you know, the 1988 release of The Satanic Verses caused an international uproar and sparked death threats and a fatwa calling for his assassination. He spent nine years in hiding until the Iranian government rescinded the fatwa in 1998, and he is since working to put that chapter of his life behind him and would like others to do the same. We are delighted to be able to talk with him today not only about his newest book, Shalimar the Clown, which is published by uh, Random House, but also about his life as a writer. So thank you so much for being with us. It's lovely to be here. It's a wonderful place. I like it. Uh, you once told director David Cronenberg, it's of no pleasure to me that I should be famous, uh, what I should be famous for is not my writing, and that of course is changing with time, and as your body of work uh, grows and is recognized still, the satanic verses made you something more than a novelist, and I know this is a subject you've grown, grown weary of talking about, so I'll ask just this one question about okay. it, and that is, how difficult has it been to get out from under the shadow of that book? Well, very difficult. You know, I mean, if you think about it, it's, uh, I mean, 1988 is a really long time ago. You know, and it's, a, it's an 18-year-old book. And not only that, but when I started writing it was more or less five years before that. So it's a book that I started writing in about 1984. That's 22 years ago. And, and yet I'm still asked detailed questions about what I thought I was doing on chapter, on, in page 174. <laughs> I mean, the truthful answer is I have no idea. <laughs> uh, because it's 20 years ago. You know, if you're being asked to, to examine and know about the day-to-day -day process of writing a book when you were 20 years younger, I mean, essentially anything I say is fiction, really. I mean, I can remember the broad the broad process of writing the book, but I can't remember any of, the, any of the real details. So it does feel like a much younger writer's book. You know, I mean, let's say when I, when I started writing it, I was 37. You know, I mean, now I'm about to be 59. You know, so um, that's a lot of water. Um, I mean, I have to say, on the other hand, that I'm very proud of it. You know, and I, I think, just put it like this, that the kind of assault that that book was subjected to was, I mean, talk about destruction testing. You know, and if, the, if that book had been weak, in my view, it would, it, it would have disintegrated, you know, because there was certainly enough attempt to pulverize it. You know, and, and the fact that it still seems to be worth reading, you know, I mean, I think is a testament to its, its literary strength, not everything else. I mean, fortunately, the scandal is kind of much less than it used to be. And so now, at long last, it's able to have the literary moment that it was denied, in a way, when it, when it first came out. Now, suddenly, people are talking about it as a book. You know, and, and as a result, it has the whole spectrum of responses. That and perhaps have. reading it for the first time, because oh, lots of people very often, yes, many, hadn't even read it who, who were talking about it. Yeah, that's right. I mean, everybody had an opinion in those days, which was, you know, again, unflattering, because, because it wasn't based on even opening the book, you know, let alone reading 550 pages. Well, anyone who is interested in, in uh, knowing more about his years in hiding and about living under the fatwa, all of that is, is in, a, in a book he penned, uh, Step Across the Line, 
uh, which is a collection of nonfiction from 1992 to 2002, and it's at the bookstore at the back of the uh, back of the room. So we hope uh, if you're interested, you'll you'll check that out. Um, I, I think I'll get the the entertainment tonight kinds of question oh, out yeah, of the way right. right off the bat. So <laughs> right. I think the only thing that comes uh, even remotely close to uh, to eclipsing the fuss over uh, over that particular book was your move in 2000 from London, where you had lived for 30 years, to New York. Mm -hmm. And then uh, your marriage to a, a young, beautiful, international model uh, by the name of Padma uh, Lachki, uh, Lakshmi. Lakshmi, Lakshmi. And, and I'm wondering if, uh, before we talk about your writing, if you'd care to comment on either of those uh, well, big, I've got, big, I'm, big I'm, moves. I'm glad we're getting, I'm glad we're getting down to the really serious stuff. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, um, you know, I'd always wanted to spend time. I mean, I've been coming to New York since I was very young. I mean, I first. I first visited New York in my early 20s, I suppose. In fact, one of the things I remember is um, arriving in, in New York and being told that they just finished the Windows on the World Bar at the top of the World Trade Center and being taken there on my first night in Manhattan. You know? And so for me, those towers represented really my moment of arrival in the city, and that also that kind of added a little twist you know, to, to the, horror, the horror of a few years ago. Um, so, I mean, I've known New York quite well, you know, since the early 70s, but not as a place to live. I mean, as a place to visit and as a place where I had a lot of friends, um, which I liked and had some, had some real sense of attraction for it, you know. And I'd always thought that I would like to, at some point in my life, just put myself there and see what happened, you know. And, and then there was that period when really I couldn't make those choices. And, and then it became possible again. And I thought, well, I'm not getting any younger, so if I'm going to do this, I'd better do it. And then, yeah, it helped falling in love. <laughs> <laughs> but it's always a nice way to arrive somewhere. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, that's it. Yes, and now I'm, now I'm the guy standing next to her. That's, that's what happens. I, I, I arrive in rooms and people go, Oh, she's not here. <laughs> I say, no, she's, she's busy today. They say, oh, well, never mind. Yeah. So, so now, yeah, it's, um, I mean, it's funny. You know, it's, it does happen a lot because she's better looking than me. <laughs> Well, let's talk about your, your most recent book, Shalimar the Clown, which seems to draw on, on all of your knowledge of culture and history and, and family and memories. Um, in fact, it's been described as a masterpiece and all-encompassing. And, and I'd like to talk a little bit about where that book came from. Well, it came from, it came from very deep down is where it came from. I mean, it's a book in a way, I've been, I was almost afraid to write about Kashmir because it's a place that I love very much, and it's a place in which a terrible thing has happened, you know, and, and I knew that it was going to be difficult, um, emotionally difficult, you know, to, to, to write it. And um, in fact, when I first thought of the idea for, for Shalimar the Clown, um, the idea of this murder in LA, for which, in fact, the explanation is on the other side of the world, um, I originally thought, well, maybe I don't actually have to the book doesn't have to really go to Kashmir. You know, it can, the book can actually be in America. And yes, that's the backstory, and it can be alluded to and so on, but maybe I don't really need to go there in the, in the book. And I s suddenly realized after a while that I was essentially chickening out, you know, that, because, I, I, because I had to go there, you know, and, and the book would, be, would have been much less, you know, if, if that had just remained off stage. And, so then at a certain point, I just took a deep breath and said, OK, I have to do this. You know? And then, I mean, there was a lot of it that was very pleasurable, because one of the pleasures of memory and of writing about the past and about the way things used to be and are not you know, anymore is that you can, in a way, bring them back. You, know, you can bring them back for yourself. You can bring the feeling of that time back. And you can offer it to other people. And so at least for the, for the period of time that people read the book. It is possible to travel in time. You know, it's possible to go back into another reality and another way of thinking, another way of being in a happier time, you know? And, and uh, that became very, you know, very pleasurable, 
doing that. And then, and then there was very painful material because of the tragedy of Kashmir. Um, so it, it began really, that was a, I'd, I'd always known that at some point in my life I would have to write about that. But it's taken a long time to get there. People always assume that so much of your writing is autobiographical and it's something you argue with mm. people. You, you're writing about things that you know and to the extent yeah. that it In this book, seems I don't think familiar. there's a single thing that's autobiographical. Um, except perhaps uh, that the grandparents, the main, so Shalimar, the clown's grandparents in the book, are a kind of comic version of my grandparents. I mean, my grandparents were not like they weren't village people, they were much more professional people and um, lived elsewhere and you know, didn't work for a traveling theater troupe and et cetera. Um, but you know, my grandmother was very ferocious. And I think one of the reasons why there's so many ferocious women in my books is, is because of my grandmother. You know, she was, I mean, I'll tell you, what, I remember when I left university and I graduated from Cambridge, I drove across the world with an English friend of mine you could do that, you know, it's a sign of how the world has changed. In 1968, you could leave London in a mini and drive to India. You know, you could drive, you could drive through Iraq, you could drive through Iran, you could drive across Afghanistan, you could cross the Khyber Pass, you could drive across Pakistan and into India. Imagine trying that now. You know, how far do you think you'd get? Uh, anyway, so we did that. And, it's a long, dusty student journey. And I arrive home, as it happened, my grandmother was visiting the house. And, you know, I, was, I had long, I had hair. I also, I also had long hair. And it was also, I also had a beard because I'd been on the road and, you know, and I was dusty and she refused to acknowledge me. I mean, she hadn't seen me. I just graduated from college. She hadn't seen me for a year and a half. She looked straight through me. And she turned to my sister and she said, tell your brother to have a bath. <laughs> and so I went and did it, <laughs> came, came back clean, still no recognition. And she said to my sister, tell your brother to have a haircut. <laughs> so that, I'm just driven 6,000 miles, but I had to drive across the street to have a haircut. And I came back, she beamed, spread her arms, she said, my grandson has come home. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if, you, if that's your grandmother, I mean, really, all the women in my family take after that. So, so I think the grandmother in the book is kind of a little bit uh, a, a, a homage to my grandmother. And the grand, my grandfather was the opposite. My grandfather was very sweet-natured. And my grandfather used to sometimes pretend to be gruff, but fooled nobody, you know. And, and I think the spirit of those two people, the kind of gentleness of my grandfather and the ferociousness of my grandmother, is in the, it's throughout the book, you know, so it, in, a, in a way, that's why I dedicated it to them, you know, because when I was thinking about, because they were from Kashmir, and, and when I was thinking about Kashmir, I really, or the spirit of the place, you know, I thought about them, really, and, and that became like a, a guiding line for me to follow. Now, you were born in, in 1947, the same year that uh, India declared its independence. Um, had that not happened, do you think you'd be the writer you no. are today? No, I mean, no, I mean, that's clearly, um, it was a, I mean, I was eight weeks old at the independence of India and it changed my life. <laughs> and there's no question that, first of all, to have had a colonial life would have been very different. You know, I mean, to have grown up under the British Empire. You know, it would have been a very different experience. Um, and also now it's very different because now really the British Empire, it's really a long time ago. You know, people, people, it's almost 60 years ago. People don't really think about it that much. And in fact, even in, you know, in my generation, people were still, in India, were still very drawn towards or attached to England and things English. You know, and, and, uh, and now it's much less the case. I mean, if there's, a, if there's a foreign attachment, it's much more to the United States. Um, you know, in those days, people wanted to send their children to Oxbridge. Now they'd much rather send them to Stanford or MIT or, you know, somewhere here. Um, so there's, in a way, the empire's gone, you know. But that generation, my generation, was the transition generation. You know, it was the generation of, of the change. And that made it 
I mean, that obviously shaped me, shaped me in all kinds of ways. And it also makes it a very interesting generation, the most mixed up generation. Mm -hmm. You know, the generation in which the future is beginning and the past is still there, you know. Um, and I mean, that's why I wrote Midnight's Children, because it's about, it's about that generation. And I thought, actually, there's something very special about a transitional generation, because, it's, because it, as I say, it contains the future and the past, you know, and lives in the present. So, um, so no, I mean, I, there's no question that it would completely, I mean, shape my family for a start, because the creation of the state of Pakistan um, divided my family <laughs> in half. You know, I mean, some of my family, I mean, it's a Muslim family, um, and many of them, including my parents, decided, decided no, they wanted to stay in India because my parents were really not religious and they didn't feel like living in a religious state, you know, but, but other members of my family did. Um, and so there was just this, you know, this uh, dividing line through the middle of my family, apart from anything else. So, yeah, there was very, very profound um, importance in my life. Yeah. You mentioned uh, Midnight's Children, which was your second uh, very acclaimed novel written mm. back in 1981. It won uh, the Booker Prize for Fiction, and in 1993 it was judged the Booker of Bookers, the best novel to win the Booker Prize for Fiction mm. in, the, in the award's 25-year history. Um, you talk about that book as a There's book. a funny story about that. Okay. I tell you. On, the, on the day of the prize giving of that Booker of Bookers thing, right? Um, the judges had been people who had been the chair people of the judges in previous years. You know, so it was a, a jury of chairmen, if you like. Anyway, one of them was very, very keen that the prize should go to William Golding um, for his novel Rites of Passage, which, uh, which also won the book. And he was so, and I knew nothing of this, right? I, mean, I just arrived and said thank you nicely. Um, and then there's a reception. And I'm introduced to this, the, the William Golding judge, and I didn't know anything about that. So, and he was so angry that I'd won that he couldn't really even say hello. <laughs> so I'm coming up to him and say, thank you very much. You know. And he just spun on his heel and walked away. And I thought, what I do? You know. <laughs> and then some of the other judges explained to me that he'd been, I mean, he'd been in a minority of one, I have to say, but nevertheless, he, he thought what he thought. Well, that was a book that you said that, that readers loved, and, and um, Shame, which was written in uh, 1983, was mm. more admired. Huron and the Sea, a children's book, you said, was something that people uh, felt deep emotional response to. And I'm wondering, over the years, how much feedback have you gotten? How important oh, is it. that to you? No, it's great. Um, I mean, it's, it's you know, one of the things that's nice about having these books stick around for a while, you know, is that people do form relationships to them, you know, and, and, um, and let you know what those relationships are. Um, in fact, shame, you know, I always thought that, with, that shame got a little bit squeezed by the fact that the book before it was Midnight's Children and the book after it was The Satanic Verses. And they're these two sort of differently very noisy books. Um, but now I'm finding that that book is getting more and more attention. Um, it's as if it's more topical now than it was when I wrote it, you know. Um, and it just does seem to be, I mean, I picked it up the other day because somebody wrote me a letter about it. And I thought, you know, this really is, it's very contemporary, this book, except that it's 23 years old. Um, but sometimes, you know, the, you know, events catch up with you. Um, and I think what's happened is that the kind of material in that book is much more what everyone's thinking about now than, than, than it was then. You know, so, so that's a book who maybe whose time has come. You know, but it's true. No, by far, by far, the best mail comes from writing for children, no question. I mean, the most enjoyable letters I've ever got were after I wrote Harun in the Sea of Stories. Um, in fact, my all-time favourite fan mail letter was from a young girl who would have been, I guess, twelve then. So, that was 1990. So, she'd be now 28. And she said um, that she was uh, in, I can't remember, it was Massachusetts, Connecticut, somewhere. She was at high school. And, and she said, you must reply to this letter at once. <laughs> because when I grow up, I intend to be a world leader. <laughs> and I thought, you know, answer this girl right now. <laughs> because and of course, <laughs> 10 years from now, she'll be president. <laughs> Just, anyway, I answered. It had an emotional punch. I, th I know lots of 
readers were, were in tears reading it, and I'm wondering before we open this up to the audience, um, I, I talked to a writer who said, if I don't cry writing it, you won't cry reading it. Oh. Do you sometimes... I, I've only once in my life cried <laughs> writing it. Um, so no, I don't think, you know, some people cry more easily than other people. Um, I mean, that, I don't say that's a good thing or a bad thing either way. In fact, I mean, I don't cry very easily and I often wish that I cried more easily because it would be useful sometimes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but there was a moment writing this, writing Shana Mal the Clown, when I did um, find myself crying and you feel kind of stupid. You think, why am I crying? I just made this stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> you write something down and, and start boohooing about it. It feels kind of dumb. Um, but it's true that that's the only time it ever happened. That's the only time. And um, now, thinking back, I mean, I'm, it's clear that, that I was in a very emotional state, you know, writing some of those climactic passages of the book when, when things go badly long, wrong in this little village in Kashmir. Um, and I was, you know, I used to be, I used to almost not want to go to my desk in the morning because of, because of what I knew I had to write. And I used to try, I tried to find ways of changing the plot so that I didn't have to write some of the bad stuff, you know. Um, and then, of course, had to smack myself down and, and get on with it. But yeah, that's the only time, though. I want to talk about your writing discipline and hundreds of other things, but I want to allow people who have come to see and talk with you a chance to ask a question. And, there are... and maybe, as they're, maybe as they're thinking of that, so whoever's a brave soul out there and would like to ask the first question, I'll talk a little bit about you. You talked about sitting down at your desk, mm. and you are, unlike some writers who can write in a cafe or in yeah. a bus, you need to be at your desk with your things. Tell us a little bit about it. I know. I mean, I, I do. And there's that wonderful essay of David Mamet's called Writing in Restaurants. And, and he did that, you know. And, and I know other people who, who do that. Um, in fact, my great friend, Helen Fielding, you know, who wrote that great work, Bridget Jones's Diary, um, she does that. She goes and sits in a corner of a, a restaurant with her laptop and scribbles. And I can't do it. I mean, I just can't do it. I, if I... Uh, if I try to do it, nothing, I never use anything that I've done, you know, so it's, it's, and, you know, poets are going to sit under trees. <laughs> you know, it, Doesn't work. You know, it's kind of, it's almost contemptible, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, poets, you know, they don't even, the lines don't go all the way across the page, and the, the lines don't go all the way down the page, and, and then they, you know, they've got 60 pages, they call it a book. You know, I, <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you've talked about, in, in the days of typewriters, being very, very concerned about sending in a very, very tidy yeah, manuscript, yeah. And, and so the computer has helped you Oh, the computer's helped a lot. I remember years and years ago, when I was much younger, doing an, a joint reading event in London with Faye Weldon, and at the end of it, the question from the audience was about that, it was about, you know, when you, when you write something you don't like, do you cross it out, do you exit out and go on? Or do you take the bit of paper out of the computer, a uh, typewriter, and put a new bit of paper in? And everybody in the audience tittered because they thought it was such a stupid question, except for Faye and me. <laughs> <laughs> because we both knew that you take the piece of paper right. out and put another piece of paper. Exactly. <laughs> um, and the computer has saved, been very good for the stationary bills in that regard. Um, yeah, no, I, mean, I was late getting to computers, actually, because I was nervous that it would change something indefinable and I wouldn't like what it, or other people wouldn't like it, or just something would be wrong about it. Um, I think the first book I wrote on a computer was The Moor's Last Side, which came out in 95, so it's not that long ago, you know. Um, but I'm completely converted. And, and actually, the, the portability of it is a great thing if you have the kind of life I have, which involves bumming around a lot. And the fact that you can have your entire office you know, in, in this one thing. You can have all your variant drafts and all your notes and everything, you know. So now I'm completely sold on it, yeah. And I think it's sp uh, sped up the process, speeded up the process because it was taking you five years to produce it's a still, book and it's... It's still, you know, I mean, this, this one was four. This one was four, but it's not as long as those. I mean, the three really long books I've written 
uh, are Midnight's Children and the Satanic Verses and the Ground Beneath Her Feet. I mean, those are upwards of 250,000 words each. And this one isn't, I mean, that, they're, they're like 650 page books, you know, and, and Shana Mother Clown is 400, you know, so it's, a, it's, a, it's shorter, thank God. <laughs> I can't do that stuff anymore. Yeah, Go ahead. You're such an astute observer of human nature and of the turbulent times that we live in. And I'm wondering if you would tell us if you're hopeful about anything. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm hopeful about some things. But no, I mean, I think it's, you know, it's a bad time. I mean, I, 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 I don't remember a worse time, you know, including Vietnam. Um, because at least Vietnam was specific. You know, this is much more diffuse. Um, the only thing that I think is this. I think, that, I think that the phenomenon of Islamic radicalism, in my view, may be a short-term phenomenon. Um, and the evidence for this, or a, a piece of evidence for this, is that wherever in the world it has become really powerful, it has very rapidly become detested. You know, so in Iran, it's detested. In Afghanistan, the Taliban were detested. You know, in Algeria, although there was initial appeal for groups like the FIS, the GIA, you know, in a very short space of time, they were loathed. You know, so it, it seems as if there is an appeal. There's, you can't deny it. There's an enormous appeal at the moment in, across the Muslim world for this very firebrand version of Islam, particularly amongst young men. Um, but when it becomes, when it actually takes over the country, you know, people very quickly realize that it isn't at all what they want, you know, and, and so that suggests to me that it may not be forever, you know, and if you think about the Soviet Union was what, 70 years, you know, um, it's, it felt like forever until the day it vanished, and when the day came, it just blew away like dust, you know, and I think this may be a phenomenon of that kind. Uh, now, of course, 70 years is a long time in a human life. You know, it's long, I mean, it's too long for me, you know. Um, but in, kind of in the eye of history, you know, it's nothing. And, I mean, that's as optimistic as I can get. <laughs> <laughs> you, you mentioned this uh, uh, Islam, and you've made a distinction between Islamists and Muslims. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you know, most, most people, even if they are religious, are not particularly religious, you know, I mean, whatever the religion is. For most people, religion is just one of the many things by which they define themselves, you know. Um, the, thing that, the thing that we're all being faced with right now is a highly organized, politicized movement which uses the language of religion, you know, and, that's, and that, of course, oppresses Muslim people around the world more than anyone else. You know, I mean, who do you think is oppressed by the Ayatollahs of Iran? You know, it's, it's uh, who was oppressed by the Taliban? I mean, one of the things that I tried to write about in, in this book, Sharimah the Clown, was the way in which one version of Islam, the very mystical, Sufi-inspired, uh, um, gentle version of Islam that existed in the Kashmir Valley, is now being itself oppressed by Islamic radicalism coming across the border. Um, you know, in Bosnia, there were, there, were, there were complaints about Bosnian Muslims from other more radical Muslim countries that the Bosnian Muslims weren't Muslim enough, you know, because they were too tolerant or something, you know. So it's not, this isn't a monolithic thing, and that's why I've never really bought the Huntington Clash of Civilizations thesis, because uh, that suggests that there are these two blocks at war with each other, you know, whereas actually the battles inside the blocks, I mean, after all, there's a big argument inside the West right now, you know, about how things should be. So the West is not monolithic, nor is the other side. Go ahead, please. Yes. You are on a university campus here with a lot of young people, very bright young people, getting ready to start out on their journey mm. as you did with your 6,000 mile trip. What advice could you give them, because they're the ones we're counting on to write the world from the course it's on today? Uh, well, I, I think, 
I think these are not very argumentative times, and I would recommend that people got, became more argumentative, really. I mean, I'm very surprised by how passive a time this is, you know. Um, and I don't think that's good for a culture, to, to be that passive and accepting. Um, and so I think, you know, more uppity behavior. That would, that would be, that would be my, my, my suggestion. We're going to get the microphone to the next person who has a question. So if you could, oh, you do. Go ahead. I'm very interested in the role of literature and social change. And along the lines of what you just recommended, a more argumentative culture, mm. um, a book that I've used with my undergrads that they really dig is Azir Nafisi's Reading Lolita and mm -hmm. Tehran. And I wondered, I had two questions about that. First of all, what you think of the book and whether you esteem it. And secondly, what I find so interesting are the texts that she uses. Mm -hmm. Of course, Lolita being one, which is more controversial. But then Jane Austen and more um, works of literature that perhaps to literary critics and professors here wouldn't seem to serve an explicit social purpose, but in that setting, with those women reading together, mm -hmm. seem to serve an important social purpose. So yeah, I like, I like it. I like it a lot, the book. And, um, and um, uh, I like it precisely because it works through, it tells the story of Iran in this rather indirect way, you know, through these texts. I mean, I think, you know, anyone who has any knowledge of the condition of women in third world countries will easily see that Jane Austen is a great third world writer, you know. I mean, I've, growing up, I've often said it about India, you know, if you, if you look at the condition of these extremely educated, very capable women who are often, I mean, as in Jane Austen, you know, trapped by the culture into husband hunting, you know. Um, you can easily, you can translate Jane Austen into contemporary Delhi or Bombay or Calcutta very, very easily, you know. So, so that, I thought, was a, in, from my point of view, was quite a natural one, you know. Um, I mean, I thought, sometimes I think she, she strains for the symbol. And I thought the Lolita thing, I'm not sure she quite pulled that off, really. I mean, her reading of Lolita in Tehran, um, I'm not sure that it was the most interesting reading, um, even though clearly it's the best title. <laughs> we'll get the microphone to the next person who has a question. Um, but it's hard to imagine being in danger for writing a book, and yet there are writers all over Everyone. the world who are in danger and oppressed. I'm wondering, before we get to that yeah. next questioner, what do you see as the role or responsibility of, of today's writers? You know, very few writers go looking for trouble. I mean, very, very few. Uh, there are some, um, but very, very few do. But it often comes looking for them, you know? And, and that's, and then you have to find what you do about it. You know, and it's not even new. You know, the poet Ovid was exiled because, of, because the emperor didn't like, you know, what he said and spent the rest of his life in exile. It's, it's, a, uh, it's an ancient problem, power and art, you know? And, I think it's to do with the fact that the, the great, not even the great, but the true artist is speaking from a completely independent point of view. You know, nobody owns him or her. You know, he doesn't, he's not speaking on behalf of an ideology or in, or in the service of something. He's just offering a vision. He's saying, I think it's like this. You know, and often, if you are a person of power trying to impose another kind of vision on, on your society, the, that independent vision of the artist can seem very irksome. You know, and I think that's why writers so often get in trouble. And then they have to deal with it. Please. Uh, my question refers to an op-ed that you wrote in uh, 2001 in New York Times. This is about Islam. In that uh, article, yes. in that op-ed, you criticized the apologetic discourses that try to dissociate the, uh, the implications of 9-11 yeah. from a discussion of uh, the crisis within the Muslim world and the failure of Muslims to modernize. Right. My question is, how, are you, uh, how would you compare the recent controversy about the Danish cartoons and what it generated in light of your experiences and how the media did contribute. Well, you know, I, mean, I think there's two different, as far as the cartoons are concerned, I mean, you can like or dislike the cartoons 
and you can believe it was right or wrong to publish them. That's one conversation, you know. The other conversation is about violence and intimidation. And I think the problem is that once violence and intimidation enters the subject, it changes the subject. You know, after that, the question is how do you respond to violence, how do you respond to violence and intimidation? And I think a lot of the people, unfortunately, who claimed to be acting sensitively and out of respect, were actually just acting out of fear. You know, and, and I think that's a very dangerous path because to give in to intimidation guarantees that there will be more intimidation. It doesn't guarantee that there will be less. There will be more. You know, and so it's a you know it's a slippery slope. I mean that's my view. And, and um, uh, well, it's a long subject, but let's leave it at that for now. I'm deeply struck by your sense of humor. I <laughs> I really enjoy uh, you. your uh, the way that you depict your characters and the and the conversational styles, particularly those South Asian immigrants. So my question was, since your immigration to this country, have you uh, noticed a difference in the, what the Ameri if you can call it, the American sense of humor and how does it differ from how you have depicted it? Well, there, is, there are those who say that America is an irony-free zone. <laughs> 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 um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure that I agree because I think in, we live in a time in which people tend to miss irony, you know, um, and it's a problem beyond the shores of this country. It's not, it's not only an American problem, but I think, I don't know, I remember at the time of, of the popularity of Monty Python's Flying Circus, I remember somebody offering a very interesting description of the dif difference between British and American comedy, um, in which they said that British comedy was based on the question, wouldn't it be funny if, right, if people had silly walks or whatever it might be, whereas American comedy was based on the question, isn't it funny that, right, um, and uh, was therefore more naturalistic, if you like, so it's more Seinfeld than Monty Python, um, and I thought that was a a really interesting distinction that seemed to have a lot of truth. You know? so, um, so I don't think, I don't think it's that there's no humor in America. I mean, people always say it about India. You know? People say people in India have no sense of humor. It's a thing you, people in India say about themselves <laughs> you know, and don't realize how funny they're being. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, not, it's just that it's different, slightly different. You know? and I, but I think the problem now is that because we're all watching each other's television programs and movies and so on, is that there's a kind of homogenizing taking place. You know, I think everyone has an American sense of humor now, unfortunately, because, <laughs> <laughs> because, of, the, because of the power of the American you know, visual media, movies and television. Speaking of movies, you said that in a formational way, movies have had more of an impact on mm. you than novels. You say you're obsessed with movies. Yeah, I mean, I may be slightly exaggerating, but, but only slightly, you know, because first of all, I grew up in a giant movie city. You know, if you grow up in, in Bombay, it's a big, bigger movie town than Hollywood. You know, I mean, more movies are made a year in Bombay than are made in California, um, or anywhere else, actually. Um, and, you know, I had bits of my family that were involved with the movies and, and so on. So and anyway, you drive around the city, it's happening, you see the movies everywhere, you know? So um, that's one thing. And then, I mean, I think when I was a college student in, in England, it was an extraordinary moment for world cinema. And I mean, in retrospect, you can look back and say that it was really the last time that the Hollywood studio system lost control of the world market, you know? Uh, but, but what actually happened was this explosion of great movies and and you know i'm talking about the early and middle and late 60s but really from the late 1950s until the early 1970s was probably the greatest period in the history of the silent cinema um, and to be watching those movies as the new movies of the week was amazing so, you know this week the new godard next week the new fellini the week after that the new visconti then the bergman then the ray then the vida then the polanski then the you know that every single week the new kurosawa the new this and that it was an astonishing moment to go to the cinema you know um, 
and the excitement of seeing those films as new movies rather than as the classics, you know, um, was quite astonishing. I mean, and at that time, I certainly felt when I was at Cambridge that I got a lot of my education in the movie theatre, you know, and not in the library. Um, and I think now it's, you know, it has had a consequence in the way I write. And I, one of the things you learn is that the things people like about your writing are exactly the things that other people don't like about your writing. And so the people who like my writing tend to praise it for being visual. And the people who don't like my writing tend to attack it for being too visual. <laughs> you know, I'm not sure what's wrong exactly with being too visual, but apparently there is something wrong with it. We want to get a question over here, but yeah. we want, maybe we'll talk about the fact that you wanted to be an actor yourself at mm -hmm. one time. Uh, Mr. Rushi, I'm very interested uh, in your view of literature in politics now. You've addressed the, uh, the idea of uh, the role of literature in politics in a number of different ways from it shouldn't be left to politicians and it's a way that we find a melange among us, uh, create a melange among us uh, to... Well, what, what I think is this, I think it's quite risky for, for literature itself to directly take on political arguments um, because it can make the book of very transient value, you know, if it's, if it's just agitprop. Um, that when the subject changes, you know, as the subject always does change, uh, the book will lose its, a lot of its value. Also, of course, particularly as we were saying me, books are very slow to write and the world changes at, at unusually high speed these days. So, so a book is not necessarily the best way um, to address some hot subject. So I mean, I've, I've found that I've, when I've been really worked up about something, I tend to write some non-fictional piece of journalism, and that's a, a faster, in my way, my view, a more appropriate response to something in the news. You know? um, what I think has happened in my novels is that I've, I've felt, come to feel that these days public issues, public events, shape private lives to a degree that they never used to. You know, if you go back a couple of hundred years, um, people could lead entire lives quite separate from the news, you know, and, and, and the ability of historical events to impact on people's daily life was much less, you know, now it's much more. And so, so now it seemed to me that a part of the explanation of the life of a fictional character must arise out of the times that he lives in. You know, and, and, and what is that interaction between the individual and the larger, the larger public sphere? You know? And I think that's become something I've become more and more interested in because I think, I mean, in many ways, I'd like to escape it. You know, it'd be very nice to write books in which you don't have to take on what's going on in the world. You know? um, but I've so far failed to do it. I'm trying to do it right now by retreating 400 years. I think this, the next book I'm writing takes place in the early 16th century. And I'm already failing <laughs> to exclude, um, but I'm trying hard. Um, an unflattering movie was made oh, in Pakistan, uh, International Guerrillas, uh, and the villain in the movie, uh, who was literally killed by a falling Koran, was named Salman Rushdie. Um, you, you said... Uh, no, by actually by a thunderbolt emerging from, the, <laughs> from, the from the a Quran. flying Quran. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, the movie you said was dreadful and appalling, yeah. and when it came to England, yeah. the government banned it, but you very aggressively wrote to the government and, and said you disagreed with that, uh, that Yeah, I, mean, I just, you know, it was just an odd thing to be fighting a... a you know, an anti-censorship battle and to be defended by an act of censorship. So, uh, I mean, the film really was awful. Um, but I, 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 it wasn't exactly aggressive. It's that I was told that one of the reasons the film was, was denied a, a certificate was the law, the law because, because the film was clearly defamatory. And if it had been given a certificate by the board in question, then the board would have been liable I mean, I could have sued them too, you know, because they would become party to the defamation. And that's why they, they didn't give it a certificate. And so I basically wrote to them giving up my right of legal recourse. And I just said, you know, I will not, I won't sue anyone. And so, the result was that the movie just fizzled. Just, yeah, exactly. And I, I, it was, you know, the, had the film been banned, it would have become, you know, a hot video. And, and everybody, and its, its power would have been enormously magnified. 
the fact that it was allowed out, you know, like vampires in the light of day, it just shriveled. Um, and it was, I mean, it was, I think, a, a good demonstration of the of the of that of the free speech position. Which is, you know, it's better to have things out in the open than under the carpet. Your style has been characterized as as magic realism, mm. and and you've been called a, a storyteller of prodigious powers. Um, your uh, You've been recognized for your verbal uh, inventiveness, and I'm wondering where your interest in language came from. Because I think it's partly that you do go back and forth from different Between cultures languages. and languages. Yeah, I mean, I think the truth is that every, every writer worth anything has some kind of very exceptional relationship with language. What, you know, and, and, and the greater the writer, the more recognizable that voice. You know, I mean, only Hemingway sounds like Hemingway. You know, um, only Garcia Marquez sounds like Garcia Marquez. You know, it, it's, a, it's one of the, one of the, well, one of the necessary aspects of the job is to try and find how to speak in your own voice, to, to how to write the sentences that are your sentences to write and not someone else's, you know, and, and um, so I think that's a, and it's also a thing that it's very hard to teach. You know, I think, I think that writing, it seems to me, comes out of voice and ear and vision. And none of that can be taught. You know, um, all you can, what you can teach is craft, which helps you do it better. You know, but if you don't have those things, you don't have anything, really. Um, so I think, like many writers, it was very important for me to find a way of, of discovering my voice. You know? and, and, and you're right. I, mean, I think one of the things that helped was coming out of a multiple language environment. You know, and I mean, in, in India, you grow up, you speak lots of languages. You have to, you know, because otherwise you can't talk to enough people. Um, and so, you know, I grew up. My mother tongue was Urdu. The national language was Hindi. Um, I went to an English medium school, and the local languages in Bombay were, were Marathi and Gujarati, so that's five. You know? and, and then there were others. Um, I'm not saying I spoke them all equally well, but, but if you have that kind of noise going on around you, it, I think it makes you playful with language. I think it, it, it means you can borrow from whichever language, whatever word you need. and, and uh, so. Quite often when people speak in Bombay, the, a sentence will contain words from more than one language. You know? so, um, and and you, just, you just use whatever is the best expression or the best word or whatever that you, that you have available from your little bunch of languages. Um, of course, in, in, in a written form, you can't, you can't do that because you, you, know, you have to write in a language. Although otherwise. you've made up words. Well, you, yeah, but that's, that's easier. Actually, but the, what, what I'm talking about is creating a written down version in one language that feels like that polyglot atmosphere. It's not really because it's written in English, you know, with maybe the odd word dubbed in here and there. But essentially, you're writing in one language, but you're trying to give it the rhythms of that, that multiple environment. And I think that helped a lot when I was starting out to think like that. Um. I'm from South Africa, and I feel this is one of the great reasons I got on a plane, is to hear you talk today. Thank you. Oh, that's I, a long journey. <laughs> <laughs> you speak, I think, also as a reader mm. of language. And one of the consequences of the levels of noise that you were describing in another context is that I think our, our silence inside is increasingly invaded um, by, by very commercial forms. and. And reading particularly suffers dreadfully, particularly among young people. And I know you're a member also of a community of writers as the president of Penn, or, or most recently. And what, what is it about the culture of reading that you participate in and that hopefully you, you see some, some improvements? Because uh, it, it is possible to very, be very pessimistic about yeah. the culture of reading. Well, I mean, the, the reasons for pessimism can be expressed in two words, of which one is Dan and the other is Brown. Uh, I mean, the, the enormous success of that book, I think, is the single most depressing fact 
um, about the current book scene because it's, you know, by any standards, to say that it's not very good is to be, to praise it highly. Um, You're referring to the Da Vinci Code. Yeah, yeah, that, that book type object. <laughs> uh, <laughs> also the same shape as a packet of cereal, of course. Uh, <laughs> um, um, but I think there are, you know, there are grounds for optimism because, you know, publishers will, whenever in the history of the world you've asked a publisher how things are, they'll always tell you they've never been so bad. You know, I mean, they, they said that when I was first publishing books 30 years ago, and they're still saying it now. So publishers have always never had it so bad. Um, but actually, I think there are substantial readerships for good books still. You know, I mean, they're, 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 they really are. And, and, and some people are luckier than others. And, but, I, but the problem is, and I mean, the South African, your South African um, origins will mean, mean you know about this, is that the problem is not so much whether there's readers as whether the books can be made available in languages that people can read. Um, and the translation issue is getting more and more and more difficult. Uh, so that, I mean, this country, above all, you know, I mean, this is the country in the Western world that translates fewest books. Mm. Um, and as a result, American readers are denied the chance to experience a diversity of culture, and a diversity of expression, you know, just simply because the books are not available, you know, in, in the language that they can read. Um, I think the number of books published, translated in a year in this country is less than 3% of the total output. And if you compare that to countries like, I mean, even in England, it's, it's more like 8, 9%. If you, once you go to places like France, it's like 15, 17, 20%. You know, so, um, now, of course, you can say the English language has a kind of dominance which explains that in part. But as I say, even if you look inside the English language world, um, the amount being translated here is, as I say, it's one third what's being translated in England. And I think that's narrowing the frame in all sorts of ways. You know, it just means that people can't, they don't know the literatures of much of the world. And one of the ways in which I learned the world was through literature. You know, I mean, before I had ever been to Latin America, I had read the literature of Latin America. Before I'd ever been to Russia, I had read the literature of Russia. And really, I mean, I still don't know Russia very well. Everything I know about Russia comes out of Russian literature, essentially, but I suspect it's right. Because, you know, when I did go to Latin America, I discovered that all those writers had told me the truth, that it really was like that, you know? It wasn't a, a fiction about Latin America, it was the truth. And I kind of, that's what I, the trouble with the phrase magic realism is that when people use it, they tend to hear the magic and not hear the realism, you know? Whereas, in fact, one of the things about going to the world of Garcia Marquez, as you discover, he's telling the truth. You know, um, he's not exaggerating; he's understating. And that, and that's really what what I've thought about India. You can't tell the truth about India; it's too weird. <laughs> you know, um, nobody would believe it. So, you, so these books, which people call fantasies, are actually mild understatements of the truth. Um, and and anyone who's been to India will know that. You know, but but I think when you haven't been there they read like outrageous exaggerations of reality. Now, when you were in hiding, you reread Moby Dick, you reread Ulysses. What's on your bedstand uh, right now, now? Well, right now, I mean, because of the Penn Festival coming up at the end of the month, which even though I'm now the ex-president of Penn, so I'm now busily you know, arranging my presidential archive and, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and um, looking to you know, build a new career in the future and so on. Um, I've been very involved with the festival, so I'm, I'm still, well, I'm really trying to you know, read some of the writers who are coming whose books I haven't yet read. You know? um, so I, mean, I have to have a conversation at the public library in New York with Amartya Sen. Um, at the end of the festival, and he's, I think, written, just written this extraordinary book called Identity and Violence, um, which is about, I think, one of the big subjects right now, which is identity politics, and, and how it contributes to discord. You know? And, and um, so I'm just reading that, and, and then we're going to discuss that. And, um, 
Ayan Hirsi Ali, you know, the, the, the Dutch Somali writer who was, who was the one working with Theo van Gogh when he got killed. Uh, I mean, it was her script that he filmed that he got killed for. She's now, she's a Dutch member of parliament but, and, you know, and has security guards. Um, and she's coming and she's written, I think, an extraordinary, it's not, I mean, it's a, it's a monograph rather than a big book. It's called The Caged Virgin. And it's basically a study of, well, it's centrally a study of women in Islam at the moment, and, um, and uses that as the basis of a, a larger polemic about Islam. And so, I mean, it's 100 pages long, but it's, it, I think, really very important book in many ways. Um, fiction, not at this moment. The problem is I'm trying to start a novel. You know, and when I'm trying to start a novel, I'm very... I don't really read fiction, I'm reading around what I'm... And since this book takes place in the 16th century, I'm diving... In, I'm reading these wonder, this wonderful book called Shopping in the Renaissance, which I strongly recommend. It's, I mean, it's, it's got a comic title, but actually, um, if you look, go and look at the great paintings of the Renaissance, and instead of looking at the Mona Lisa, you know, if you look at the corner of the picture, there's somebody selling bread. You know, and, and, and so if you look in the corners of these works of art, you actually see ordinary life. You know, and, and what you need if you're going to write a novel, you don't need the political history. You need ordinary life. You need to know how did people go shopping. You know, if your tooth hurt, what did the dentist do to you? Um, that stuff, you know. And so I'm just trying to... And in my novel, there's a kind of... It's, the novel is partly set in 16th century India and partly in 16th century Italy. And there's a journey between the two. And so I have to learn the ordinary life of two worlds, not just one. And um, I'm reading that. That's what I'm reading. <laughs> <laughs> I think we will uh, wrap things up. I have, I have one final question, and that is, by any measure, uh, you've enjoyed tremendous success as a writer. Um, uh, uh, significant body of work, literary awards, uh, fame. But I'm wondering if you have become the writer you had always wanted to be. Well, that's a good question. Um, not exactly, because I think life never goes where you think it's going. You know? um, and I think even in, in the course of a single novel, you, know, you never quite finish the book that you start. You know, that, that somewhere in the act of writing the book, things shift and change and, and you, you discover things and you, you, you come to the conclusion that something you thought was a good idea wasn't that good or, um, you know, the book evolves and, and by the time, especially if you take four or five years to write it, by the time you finish it, it is not quite the book that you, I mean, hopefully it's a better book than the one that you started, you know, but it's certainly a slightly different book than the one that you started and I think, that happens to the whole literary life as well, you know. Um, I, because also the world changes in ways that you can't foresee and affects you in ways that you can't foretell, you know. Um, so no, I mean, if I, if I, at, in my, you know, when I started out, I mean, it's now, my first novel was published in 1975, so it's now 31 years ago since I started publishing books, and more than that since I started writing them. I couldn't have dreamed of sitting here. You know, I would never have, never have thought I'd have got here. I mean, even you know, when Midnight's Children was, came out, uh, I mean, I was very happy that it got good reviews. You know, and I, I thought, well, maybe it'll be bought by a couple of thousand people who are not close friends or family <laughs> members. You know, and that would have been fine. You know, I mean, the idea of this kind of global thing going on with books selling hundreds of thousands of copies and being translated into 42 languages, I, I, you know, I would never in my wildest dreams have thought that that would happen. So um, I'm glad it did. Well, thank you all for coming and thank you very much. Thank that you. was very, very enjoyable. Thank you so much.